Hello, I am Dr. Carolyn Eaton, and this week in medicine, I am talking about the immune system. Now, the immune system itself is extremely complicated, so I'm going to do two versions right now. Version one, the most stripped down basic, and if it's good for you, then you're good. What happens is that when you have that infected cell, you have our viral cell from last week, it sends out a help me signal using chemicals and proteins, and that causes your immune system to respond and send a couple of different other kinds of cells to the rescue. It, one group will actually work on containing the infection and another group will start making antibodies so that you can get rid of the infection and help protect you from future infections from that particular virus or other pathogen, period. That's the most basic version. Now, if you wanna know some details on all, how all that happens, that'll take me about the next nine to 10 minutes. All right. So let me define a few things. First is a term called cytokines. Now you've been hearing that on the news because of cytokine storm and all of that. Cytokines are a protein that one cell makes that tells another cell what to do. And there's lots of different types of cytokines, but two of the bigger ones when we're talking about the immune system are interferons, which do exactly what it sounds like. They will interfere with a virus or bacteria's ability to reproduce and interleukins. Interleukins uh, primarily work on inflammation, but they've got a lot of other pathways that they work on as well. But we think about them as being inflammatory modulators. Some will increase inflammation, some will decrease inflammation. Now there's some cells you need to understand about. One is called a dendritic cell. Dendritic cells in their immature state live in the tissues. So they're in between the other cells for the liver or the kidney or on your skin and they have little tendrils that are in between the cells that constantly sample for abnormal proteins or RNA, anything that the cell is putting out that it should not be. They are the quality control managers for the cell tissues. The next set of cell type to understand are T cells. Now, there's lots of different subtypes of T cells, but I'll, I'll refer to them as about two different types. There's lots more than that. And the T cells were made by your thymus. Now your thymus is a gland that's only active in childhood. By adolescence, it shrivels up and goes away. So all of the T cells your body will have were all made during your childhood. It's one of the reasons that a 14 year old is going to have a much better immune response to something than a 70 year old will. Now the last one I'm gonna talk about on cell type is something called a B cell. B cells are the cells that actually will manufacture, manufacture antibodies. And they also will store the memory for previous antibodies. So if you've been exposed to that particular infection before, it will let you know. All right, so let's get on with what's all going on. So back to our infected vir viral cell. And it's being forced to reproduce virus. And so it sends out a help signal called an interferon. So the interferon, uh, which is the cytokine, is going to go to neighboring cells and will also go to that dendritic cell. Now, the dendritic cell is also probably picking up all of that foreign protein from the capsid, that coat around the virus that is its protective coat. And so it's picking up that as well. It's picking up the interferon, and it knows the cell is in trouble. The cell has an infection. So at this point, the dendritic cell will generally engulf that infected cell, so it'll eat it. And as it digests the parts of the cell, it will then parse out those bits that are foreign protein and foreign RNA. And it will go through, and as it matures, as it moves through the tissue and into the lymphatic system, it will move that foreign bit of protein to, the, to its outer cell membrane. And that is actually what forms what we call an antigen. Antigens are the bits of uh, foreign invaders, so to speak, that the cell can go back and the immune system can go back and identify as the thing we have to fight against, the infection. And so it does that. And so in a mature state, the dendritic cell is an antigen presenting cell. Now, who does it present the antigen to? To T cells and B cells. So the T cells will pick up that information off the dendritic cell, okay, this is the antigen, this is the invader, we need to go kill the cells that are creating this infection. And so it actually activates something called a cytotoxic T cell. And so those are gonna to go to the site of the infection. 
In the meantime, the B cell that identifies it looks at the antigen and takes it back and it's like, okay, have we seen this before? If you have had this infection before, been presented with this antigen before, it will upregulate the immune system, which is already set and ready to go and be able to fight off the infection very quickly. If it hasn't seen this cell before, hasn't seen this antigen before, it has to create a new antibody. And so then it takes it back and then starts to clone that antibody and ramp up the numbers. Now it'll take about a week for your B cells to make enough of the antibody to clear the infection. Sometimes a little longer, which is why a regular viral infection will take about seven to 10 days to get well, because that's how long it takes the immune system to create those antibodies and clear the infection. Now in the meantime, what your body's gonna do, in addition to trying to kill those infected cells with the cytotoxic T cells, um, what they do to kill the cell is they will, uh, they create an enzyme called perforins and they perforate through the cell membranes of the infected cell and they inject granulozymes and dissolve it. In the meantime, they activate some other cells to come and eat the infected cells. So they're very busy. And all the bees, and the other thing that they're gonna do is they're gonna start releasing some of these interleukins. Now, a couple of the interleukins, one of the interleukins they're gonna release is interleukin six. And that's one of the most important ones for fever. And other interleukins will trigger the creation of prostaglandin E2. Now, the prostaglandin E2, interleukin six, they're gonna go to the hypothalamus of the brain and trigger a fever. Now, fevers are really essential for being able to clear infections. And every vertebrate will do what it can to elevate its base temperature because any invader in our bodies is already accustomed to or uh, ready, is comfortable at the same temperature our body is at. So basically 97 to 99 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 36 to about 37.3 Celsius. And going out of that normal range also makes it uncomfortable for the infection. And so it will reduce the ability of the virus or the bacteria to be able to reproduce. So of course we're talking about viruses here. Um, so what happens is the prostaglandin, the prostaglandin E2 and the interleukin-6 go into the hypothalamus of the brain. And the hypothalamus of the brain then is going to release two neurotransmitters. And those are called norepinephrine and acetylcholine. The norepinephrine is going to cause the blood vessels in your arms and legs to vasoconstrict. It'll also cause some of the blood vessels around the stomach to constrict a little bit too. So that's one of the reasons you do want to quote unquote starve a fever um, because you wanna make sure you're not stressing your gut or stressing the, the blood flow to the gut. So the other thing that's gonna be released is the acetylcholine and the acetylcholine triggers the muscles to start to react and move and basically gives you the shivers and shakes. So those two things, vasoconstricting the periphery, the periphery of your body, raises the core temperature, and then shaking will also raise the core temperature of the body. So it's one of the weird things when you have a fever, you're hot, but you feel very cold because your body's trying to make it more uncomfortable for the invader, for the virus, than it is for you. This is also why, if possible, you want to try to let the fever run its course as much as you can. Now, if you have one of those underlying conditions, uh, such as febrile seizure disorder, obviously you can't do that. You have to bring the fever down. But if you're able to tolerate a fever up to about 103, this is beneficial for you. Anytime you start getting any hallucinations or delusions, anything of that nature, you need to make sure you bring the fever down. But if you can tolerate it, please do so. So in the meantime, when you have a fever, keep yourself very, very hydrated because dehydration is one of the more serious complications of a prolonged fever. Now, the other benefit of letting the fever go is that yes, with the initial reaction of the fever, your body creates an increase in inflammation. But as the fever continues, it downregulates it and will decrease that inflammation. So yes, you wanna go ahead and, and do what you can to let the body fight off a virus as best you can. Because especially right now, we don't have a lot of treatments for uh, the COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So trying to do what you can to let your own immune system do what it can will benefit you. So, and that's 
basically the immune system in a nutshell as much as I can. It is extremely complicated. There are so many different pathways and enzymes that go on that try to help you fight infections. If you have more questions, I strongly recommend you go to immunology.org, which is a wonderful website run by the British Society for Immunology. And if you're curious about what a dendritic cell looks like, uh, Wikipedia has this really beautiful 3D rendering of a, a dendritic cell, and I strongly recommend you check that out. And I will put uh, the links for both of those at the top of this page so that uh, if you're at the main This Week in Medicine page, you should be able to link on that and see them directly. Thank you for your time. I hope you have a wonderful week. Stay safe and stay healthy. Next week, we'll talk about something much more basic, knee pain. Have a great day.